we identified the profile of the spiritual man in various ways. When we began our first message yesterday in the morning, we said that the spiritual man is one who is described in the Bible as complete, as mature. He is one that possesses the wisdom of God. He is one that is taught by the Spirit of God through God's revealed Word. And so we want to bring us all back again to the Bible and back to the Bible and back to the Bible again because it is there that we learn the wisdom from God to appraise rightly all things for their true value so that we may be able to order our lives to receive the blessings of God. And we said that the man who is contrary to the spiritual man, the natural man, is one who does not possess God's wisdom, but he possesses the world's empty wisdom. We said that it is crooked, it is wanting, and it will lead to grief and sorrow. And so the man, the natural man, limited by his natural senses, is unable to value spiritual truth. And he does not have the Spirit of God to teach him. And so this is very sad, isn't it? But we also see that there are those who have come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, we realize that there is this, we are still in this earthen vessel. There is this flesh of ours that still plague us. And this is what we want to talk about today. How God, by His mercy, by His grace, gives us that strength, that power to overcome the flesh and live the spiritual life that God wants us to live. That complete, mature Christian. And it is definitely possible. It is attainable. The kind of families that God wants us to bring up, the kind of relationships we have in the family, between the husband and wife, between the father, mother, with the children. Well, God has a blueprint that when we follow it, you find that life would be beautiful. Life would be worth living for. But there is the other side of it. When we are not filled with the Spirit of God, the flesh takes over. And you see that this fleshly man is, good as, is as good as a natural man because we don't live according to the will of God. And that's why, you know, we said that we are awaiting the day when Christ will return and give us his reward. And we want to be there receiving the rewards that God has for us. And therefore, we would need to know the kind of life that is pleasing in the sight of God, the kind of life that brings honour and glory to His name, and it's all given to us in His Word. And we have painted for us the picture of the spiritual man in the Beatitudes. Right? We said that the mystery of godliness is found in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who came in the flesh, entered human history 2,000 years ago to demonstrate to us in no uncertain way how we can live that godly life. 
And Christ, in His time on earth, has lived that life, and He has spoken. Right? So we have said that the words of Christ are the very words of God enunciated for us so that we may imbibe this godliness in us. And the Bible tells us that when you have, when you are complete, you are perfect, you are mature, you are yielded to the Spirit of God, trusting God moment by moment in your life, how beautiful is that life? And the Lord wants us to enjoy that life every day, moment by moment, fed by the Spirit of God, strengthened by the Word of God within us. And so the Word of Christ was spoken to us and we saw yesterday how it began with a sense of, an acute sense of our spiritual need. Right? Jesus' first words when he spoke was this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says that the way to receive blessing of God is to begin to acknowledge our spiritual need before God, that we cannot order our lives, that we need God. And that's the beginning of wisdom. And as we reflect and see our acute lack, our depravity, our poverty, our need, then we come to a state where God would cost us to have godly sorrow for the life that we are living, the life of sin that we ought not to live, and yet we are living. And, you know, there is that sorrow in our hearts that cost us to forsake sin. We are willing to repent of it. And, you see, sin is such a thing that it takes a strong hold on you and it has a bondage upon you. And if you allow it to fester in your life, you're going to not be able to break it until you hit rock bottom. And this we see many a times in the life of God's children. And therefore, it is so important that we take time off, take stock, to check our lives. And this is done, this should be done on a moment by moment, daily basis, as we draw nigh to God in our lives. And so, we were told right, that when we mourn for our sins, we will be comforted. God comforts our hearts when sin is put away. The filth of sin is taken away from our hearts. God brings, manifests in us His peace and His joy, the kind of peace and joy that the world cannot experience. Heavenly peace, heavenly joy, given from God when sin is put off, put away, killed in our lives. And then you see that God helps us through the molding of our lives to put on meekness. We said that meekness is the ability to submit to the will of God in your life. And we mention right, how the spiritual man, the man of God, all go through great trials. They have to go through the wilderness experience. God has to bring us through the fire through the waters, and you go through the fire, you go through the furnace, and you are rid of the dross. Right? You are purified.
and you become a meek person, submitted to the will of God. That's why when God called Moses at the burning bush, you know, he gave many reasons why he ought not to go. Because God has reduced him to realize that he is nothing. Right? After 40 years, he was still taking care of the father-in-law's sheep. Right? For Jacob, Jacob owned a lot of sheep. Right? After 20 years, he came back, wow, a very prosperous man. But Moses, after 40 years, he was still owning, he was still tending the father-in-law's sheep. He had nothing of his own, nothing to talk about in this life. But that is the life that God can use when we are reduced to utter dependence. That's why Jesus began with those words. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. You would experience the blessing of heaven in your life when you are willing to draw near to Him, to humble yourself, to see your spiritual need. The term beatitude comes from the Latin adjective meaning supreme or utmost blessedness or happiness. So this first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 5 is Christ's blessing to you. How you can find supreme utmost blessedness and happiness in this life. Wow. What a formula. What wisdom. And this wisdom you can't find on earth. It has to be given us to us by the Heavenly Father sending His Son, coming, condescending Himself in human flesh. And our text tells us in verse 1 uh, that Jesus, seeing the multitude, went up into a mountain. It was from a mountain the mountain of Sinai that God pronounced the law. And it is on this hill of the Beatitudes that Jesus now expounds it. And you see, if you go to the Holy Land, I was mentioning yesterday, how it is a very wonderful grassland. And, you know, you can see the flowers blooming, and the people sitting comfortably in the beautiful environment, overseeing the Sea of Galilee. It was a calm and relaxed environment. Why did we have to choose a campsite so that the people of God can come together in a calm, in a relaxed, in a beautiful environment so that they may be able to in the beautiful sanctuary that God has allowed right, for our use to contemplate and be attuned to learn the truth of God, right? the profile of the spiritual man. Wow, what grace God has given to us. So this is our text for this morning, uh, the spiritual man's profile, part two. Right, shall we read together from verse 7 to 12 of Matthew chapter 5? Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Let us pray. Father, we want to commit this time into your hand. May thy spirit come and instruct us so that we may understand thy word. This I pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. We have studied the first four Beatitudes. And now we are in the next four. And I'd like to help us to see that there is indeed a correlation between the first set, the first four, and the last four. And while we were studying the Gospel of Matthew, we said this, right? how Jesus, when he came upon earth, what was his message to the people? Repent, he tells them, for the kingdom of hand is at hand. Right? He tells the people straight forward, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And John the forerunner of Christ preached. What did John say? John, Matthew 3, 8. Bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. And so, when you put on the character of Christ in you, right, you'll find that it would bring forth fruits the fruits of repentance in your life. If you know your poverty of spirit, you come to God and you plead with Him for filling. What will you receive from God? You will be filled by Him. You will receive His mercy. You will receive His guidance. You will receive His strength. And then, because you are so filled with God's love in your heart, you know how to express it in the way you live. And therefore, the Lord tells us that the spiritual man's life must begin with his life with God. That devotional life, when it's real, it will manifest itself in this second table. Right? So we said, the poor in spirit, merciful, godly sorrow, when you would be willing to mourn for your sins, to put them away. What is the result? Well, you'll be comforted. But what is the fruit? Well, you would... See God, there is that purity of heart that is within you. It's so beautiful. God can use a clean vessel, surely. God's will, God's plan, God's truth will function in and through such a person. And there is that meekness of spirit. The meek shall inherit the earth. One who is yielded to God. Well, God will always take care of him. And God, God never fails to take care of his people. When we are submitted to him, that meekness of spirit. And then God gives to us that hunger and thirst after righteousness when we would live that Christian life that God would want us to live. What is the result? Well, the Lord tells us that you would face 
opposition, obstacles, persecution. But what is the fruit of it? Now there is a sublime joy, there is a sublime calmness, there is a sublime uh, peace that pervades the heart of God's people. They know that this is what they ought to do and they stand their ground. And there is a peace in their heart because they know that God will take care. And therefore, the Lord said, <clears throat> Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. How to rejoice and be exceeding glad in those circumstances? Well, this is what we are going to look at today. And so we begin and we summarized for us the next four. Compassion, purity of heart, holiness. God make you a peacemaker. The peace of the gospel, the peace of God permeates from your life to the life of the people around you. And then, you suffer persecution for living the Christian life. And God developed in you a sense of joy amidst the trial. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Distresses and calamity comes to the Christian life. And sometimes we said we are caught off guard. A sudden phone call, bad news. Whether it's death or sickness, our heart weighs heavy. Tears roll down. And, but the tears of the believer is not like the tears of the unbeliever. The believer would experience the presence of God in his life. The prophet Jeremiah gave this testimony during the most difficult time of his ministry, when God's people was chastised, the Babylonians came and raised Jerusalem to the ground, and the people of God were brought exile to exile. And he, as a prophet of God, told the people to submit to the ruler that God has placed. And this was his testimony amidst a most difficult time. He says this in Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Now, before this, he says in verse 21, This I recall to my mind. Therefore, have I hope. Uh, what did he recall in his mind? Well, verse 22 and 23. That we have, we serve a faithful God whose mercy never fail us. You know, you read the Psalms, 
you will hear the psalmist saying, the mercies of God endureth forever. The mercies of God endureth forever. The mercies of God endureth forever. Indeed, the mercies of God, the loving kindness of God never fails. You can always call to your God for mercy and you will always receive mercy from God. That's why, you know, the Christian can be merciful. Learn how to be merciful because we receive mercy from God. Mercy is the undeserved kindness of God showered upon His people. It is because of the unfailing love of God that we have our being and we have our life. And did we first love God? No. We are rebels, or we were rebels. But He was the one who reached out to us in our iniquity, in a state when we do not deserve to save us. That's why the prophet Jeremiah says, it is by the mercies of God that we are not consumed. If God were to come after us, after our sins, we would have died many times over. That's why Jesus began the profile of the spiritual man by describing him as one having a poverty of spirit. This must perv permeate our lives because that is where we are willing to call upon God and ask our, our hearts are tender before God and we are willing to call upon Him and we receive God's unfailing compassion because He is an all-merciful God. That's the character of God. That the Jeremiah experience. We cannot but come to God in total surrender. He is so merciful. You know, when David counted in his pride the men of Israel in his old age, God would judge Israel. And the Lord gave him three judgments. This, this, or this. He says, Lord, you choose. You know what is best. And the Lord truly chose the least painful of all. That's our God. We fall into sin. And God provide a way for us. And, you know, we serve such a merciful God. And if God is merciful, then this must be uh, kind, there must be the kind of understanding in our hearts for all the good that we have received that you know, we have so much stored up good in our hearts, in our lives. That, that is the experience of God's people, you see. When you have a poverty of spirit, you would always cry out to God, God, give me, make me the man you want me to be. Make me the spiritual man you want, it to, want me to be. And you plead with God that He form His character in you. And it would be manifested right, as in the life of the spiritual man. Right? And you see that God's character is formed amidst trials, amidst suffering. It is those times where we are in a furnace that our hearts are tender 
that we are willing to listen to the voice of God. And so Jeremiah says, I have hope. And he says that your compassion fail not. <coughs> fail not. Right? Uh, it, it means that your compassion is not exhausted. We have an inexhaustible uh, compassion with God. And so the believer's life, uh, during one of our, our 2016 uh, anniversary, we studied this verse and we gave this thoughts. We said that the people of God rejoices in God's unfailing love and rests in His goodness. The mercies of God. And there is that spiritual inclination whereby we are able to express that to the people around us. And our Lord's compassion Never run dry. There was a pastor, late pastor named Rogers. He gave this example. He's an American Baptist pastor. And he says, Have you gone to Nagara Falls and watched the water rampaging with torrential falls? I've thought, surely the water is one day going to dry up. But it hasn't. Friend, greater than Nagara is the compassion of the Lord. The Lord wants us to see how great is His love toward us. How great is His love for us. It never runs, runs dry. Have you broken a piece of glass before? It was one morning, early morning, I was trying to take something uh, from a cupboard. And then a picture frame fell to the ground. Wow, and the glass shattered. And it was all over the floor. I think the lights was not on. I had on the lights and I took a vacuum cleaner trying to clean up. You know, but I still got cut on my feet. And I said to myself, wow, this broken glass, shattered into small pieces, humanly speaking, impossible to put back, right? But not impossible with God. The God who made us can also remake us. Jeremiah went to the potter's house and there he was caused to hear God's words. He saw the potter making a work on the potter's wheel. The vessel that he made was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made again another vessel as seemed good to the porter to make it. And the Lord gave these words to the house of Israel. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this porter? Saith the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the porter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. God is sovereign over our lives. He is the porter and we are the clay. And the clay yields itself to the porter as the Christian submits himself to the authority of God. When clay is first brought in from the field, it is unusable. 
hard, full of impurities. But as the clay is refined, so too must the Christian be refined so that he can be shaped into a useful vessel by the master porter. And so we go through that process of shaping by the Lord. Impurities have to be removed. Tempering agents added. The Christian has to be softened and kneaded. And after the master porter has formed and shaped the Christian according to his will and pleasure, he then must bring him to be tried by fire in order to be strengthened for the function God wishes him to perform. So we said that the life of God's people go through that process. And as we go through the fiery furnace, we cling on to God even more and God makes in us a vessel meet for his use. And God gives to us that ability, ability to uh, stand, to do our duty and to receive our reward. The hymn, Lord Crucified, if you have heard before, uh, we have taught you right, to rekindle our love for the Lord. Right? You remember? Lord crucified, give me a heart like thine. Help me to know. Teach me to love the dying souls of men and keep my heart in closest touch with thee and give me love, pure Calvary love to bring the lost to thee. We were once lost. And we were found. And therefore, we are able to, by the grace of God, express that love. Right? Shall we sing together? Lord crucified, give me a heart like thine. Help me to love the dying souls of men. And keep my heart in closest touch with thee And give me love, pure Calvary love To bring the lost to thee Amen Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Every born-again Christian have been freed from the bondage of sin and therefore able to choose not to sin. If you have been freed from the bondage of sin, there is a power within you to say no to sin. There is a power within you that God gives to you that enables you to choose not to sin. And this is the life that God would want His people to live. Right? The born-again Christian has the ability to choose not to sin, to live a holy life. And this, we said, are uh, those with a pure, who are pure in the heart. 
And this, this purity would permeate in every area of our lives. When the Spirit of God comes to regenerate us, right, we would receive that. Right? And the Lord tells us that we would be able to uh, receive that kind of life. Right? And, um, and we are, the Lord helps us right, to repent of our sins as we confess them before God and we receive strength from God, forgiveness from God. And you see, the life of the Christian with God is a life that God lives through us. And that purity of heart is not a freedom from temptation. Today we are going to talk a lot about this. It's not a freedom from temptation but the power to overcome temptation. This is what the Lord gives to us, the power to overcome temptation. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in His holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing of the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. That is the life of that spiritual man. And God gives him that strength. Yeah, I'm going to stop here so that we can uh, have a uh, 10 minutes break before we come back again. Uh, we will continue. Okay, let's take a break now.